The following program is brought to you by the University of Alabama. Good evening. It is my pleasure to welcome you to an event that has generated an electricity of excitement here on campus and in North Lawn, the 3MT competition. 3MT is a really exciting research competition for graduate students where they have three minutes to explain their research, their dissertation, which could be 800,000 words. It would take nine hours to say, um, and we give them three minutes. The goal is to train students to be able to distill their complex research down to three minutes and down to something that a regular, educated person off the street can understand. 3MT is a training opportunity disguised as a competition. Students learn to present their research topics to a broad audience in ways that really emphasize the life-changing importance and potential impact of the projects that they're devoting years of their lives to carrying out. They're given these very strict parameters that they have to follow and it really forces them to think about their work in a really um, sort of focused and articulate way. The reason the 3MT competition focuses on three minutes and one slide is to help students get directly to the heart of the why. What we train them to do is to grab the audience's attention with this big picture, gauge the interest level of their listener, and then they can go into more detail. These are students who are doing things that relate to the everyday person on the street, be they anywhere in Alabama. And I want these people to go away with, going, with saying, hey, no, the, the, this is, I, I can see the applicability of this. This, this is good. This is actually furthering uh, technology. This is helping me. I want to thank the organizers, especially Dr. Corey Perdue, who is in the back and who works tirelessly year-round to make this happen. Yeah, let's give her a round of applause. So that said, uh, I'd like to um, mention the two criteria that the judges will be thinking about so that all of you can have this in mind. This is an international competition, so the criteria are uh, stated up front. We didn't make them up, but the judges will be listening for two main elements. The first is comprehension and content. In other words, can this come across to someone outside the field? And the second is engagement and communication. So the judges will rate each of those categories and then of the 15 finalists, we'll be selecting four um, top winners and then a People's Choice winner. Thanks to the support from the Office of Research, all 15 finalists will be recognized with a monetary award for making it to this stage in the competition. So, without further ado, I will turn the microphone over to uh, Kathy Pagani, who will introduce the judges and kick off the competition. Thank you. So my name is Kathy Pagani. I'm the Associate Dean of the Graduate School, and it's my great pleasure to introduce our judges for this evening. Now, I'd like to ask the judges, when I call your name, to stand up for a moment, please, for recognition. And we're just going to go in alphabetical order. We'll start with Ms. Linda Bonin. She is the Vice President for Strategic Communications here at the University of Alabama. Dr. Alexa Chilcutt, who is the director of our public speaking program. The Honorable John H. England Jr. was not able to attend tonight. Um, we have Dr. Dave Franco, who is the uh, Associate Provost and uh, Dean of the Graduate School Emeritus. Dr. John Hinkabotham, Associate Vice President for Research. Dr. Catherine Randall, Chair of the Alabama Ac Academy of Honor and Pettis Randall Holdings, LLC. Ms. Anjana Venkatesan, PhD student, and the 2015 3MT first place winner here at the University of Alabama. And we have Dr. Kevin Whitaker, who is our interim provost. So I will begin now by introducing our competitors for this evening. Our first finalist today is Yogendra Patil from the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. His talk tonight is E equals F squared. Let's revolutionize the way we do exercise. 
I grew up in a small town called Kolapu, which is in the state of Maharashtra, India. And uh, since I was I was a kid, I always had interest in the field of mathematics and engineering. And this is where I want to pursue my future career. I heard from my friends that uh, United States is the best place where you can grow, you know, learn some new stuff. And when I came over here, that's what I found. When I started my PhD degree, that's when, when I learned, okay, how do you do critical thinking? Like if you build something, how do you make it more better every day? So that was the thing that I learned. My PhD research works deals with developing a computer software that can allow us to play computer games using exercise machines. Nowadays, uh, we see that obesity is a big issue. People tend to spend more time in the chair on the computer rather than on treadmill. So what I want to do is like move them from the chair to the treadmill. Eventually, I want to extend further for general public. For example, all people, they can use this to, you know, do their regular exercises. Young people, anyone, anyone throughout the world. The most in interesting part about this research is that you get to develop computer games and you also get to work on how computer game development process works. So that's the best part of this project. Like every day I think about like how, how I'm going to make this technology better and better. All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Now you all must have heard this proverb which means without time off from work one gets really bored. So what do we do when we get bored? Well, some of us would like to take a walk, maybe chat on Facebook, watch YouTube videos, or even play computer games, right? So it looks like work and play are entirely two different aspects and they cannot exist at the same time. However, what if I tell you that I can combine both work and play together to create a lifestyle in which you and I will be motivated to perform daily exercises? Sounds fun, right? Now, currently there are different types of exercise equipment or machines available. But you see, these equipment or machines have only the work part. So the question arises, how do we add the fun part? And this is where my research kicks in. My research study deals with implementing a revolutionary computer software that can allow us to play computer games using exercise machines. But in order to understand what my computer software does, you have to know its two major component. The first one is called plug-in. Plug-in, which simply means connect one thing into another. Now, plug-in is a computer code that allows to connect exercise machines with computer games. Kind of like a bridge, you see, that allows to connect one point to another. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, what's so difficult about this thing? I mean, any person with computer coding experience can do this. And that might be true. However, you see, these games designed by me are not just any regular computer games, but are designed using a technique known as operand conditioning technique. And this leads to the second component, operand conditioning games, which simply means conditioning the game scenarios depending upon the operations carried out by the game user. Imagine my computer game like a gym instructor that instructs you to perform exercise correctly using the concepts of rewards and punishments. For example, say if you're performing exercise correctly, then the game will display motivational messages or even increase game points. But if you make incorrect motions or actions, then the game punishes the user by reducing points. And because of these type of gameplay scenarios, the user will relate their motion behavior with punishment and reward and eventually learn to perform exercise correctly. A recent experiment conducted using my computer software has shown an accuracy of 93%. So what does this 93% accuracy indicate? Well, this result points to one thing and that is, when you add work and play together, exercise finally becomes fun and fun. And that is what I mean by E equals S squared. Thank you. It was fun. It was really fun. Like, I didn't expect it to be like um, that easy, but I liked it. I enjoyed it. But I don't know what judges want to see. 
but uh, everything was like according to the plan, just straight to the plan. So, and I didn't have any plan B. So. <laughs> We will give the judges a quick moment after each presentation to write their assessments and do their scoring. So there may be a little pause between competitors. Just bear with us on this. Thank you, judges. Our second competitor this evening is Karine Nordine from the Department of Communication Studies. Her presentation is entitled, Bruises Without a Name, College Student Perceptions of Domestic Violence Terminology. I want to start off by asking everyone to close your eyes. I want you to think of the last 10 college students you interacted with. I want you to picture their names, their personalities, think of their faces. Statistically, seven of those students seven of your students are victims of domestic violence. Nationally, the Coalition Against Domestic Violence estimates that the amount of college students who are victims is around 43%. But here at the University of Alabama, that number is much higher. Research done by Dr. Tricia Witte estimates that between 70 and 80% of University of Alabama students have been victims of domestic violence. Unfortunately, the only people more unaware of this violence epidemic than we are, are the students themselves. 60% of victims of domestic violence said they didn't know at the time that the relationship they were in was abusive. But why? Why don't college students understand what domestic violence is? My research poses one answer to that question, an answer that's quite literally never been investigated before. Terminology. When college students experience violence in their relationships, what do we call it? We could call it domestic violence, but domestic seems to imply living together, and most college students don't. We could call it intimate partner violence, but that's a research term which most college students don't understand. We could call it dating abuse, but what if they're not dating? What if it's one of those infamous college flings? When we don't have a name for something, we treat it like it doesn't exist. But my research is going to find a name. I give students vignettes, small stories of domestic violence, and then I ask them, what would you call it? I have them rate terms like domestic violence or relationship abuse on a scale of one to seven of how comfortable they are with that term. By the end of my research, I will know what our college students call domestic violence, and we can start using that term to improve awareness campaigns and prevention materials. We can use it to stop domestic violence here at the University of Alabama. I'll leave you with this. Sexual assault used to be an invisible epidemic but we brought it into the spotlight and saved countless students. Domestic violence is the next hidden demon. And the only way to pry our college students from his terrifying grasp is to finally give that problem a name. Thank you. I think it went really well. I was really pleased. I was nervous for the first like four or five seconds and then as, so as soon as it clicked in my head that this was like my passion and like my life's work then I was like okay like just talk. Our third competitor this evening is Miriam Holloman from the Department of Anthropology. Her talk is entitled A Cross-Cultural Framework for Measuring Attitudes Toward Disability. My name is Miriam Holloman and I'm from the Department of Anthropology and I'm researching attitudes towards disability and how that impacts the social integration of disabled people in society. I have a condition that I was born with, it's called Ehlers-Danlos. It's a connective tissue disorder. So like growing up, when I was little for example, to get people to understand like what was wrong with me and what my disability was, I would explain to them, like to the kids, that I was like a porcelain doll. And they could play with me, but had to be a little bit more careful, like not to bump into me or 
let me focus and I would end up in the hospital. So I'm originally from the Netherlands, but I lived and worked in Poland for two years. And I noticed like a big difference between the Netherlands and Poland in terms of the accessibility of the environment and therefore like also how often you see people with disabilities like out in the street or in daily life. But I realized like some people are confronted with this every single day. They don't have access to like shops or movie theater or the bank or any other places because not all places are accessible. We're all people with different, different abilities, different limitations, but we all have the same desires to be included and to be part of the world. It's not so much about making special accommodations for a few people, but just making it accessible for everyone. Imagine you're standing at the foot of a castle. You can see and hear people inside. They're talking and laughing and having a good time, and you want to join them, but there's no way to get into this castle. There are no stairs. And then you remember that everyone else can fly. And so they simply jumped up off the ground and flew inside the castle. And because most people they know can fly, they didn't think to build stairs for those who can't. This is what it feels like when you're in a wheelchair and there's no ramp or lift to get inside a building. My research focuses on attitudes towards disabilities and how this shapes the social integration of disabled people in society. Various attitudes towards disability skills have been developed, but these rarely can be applied cross-culturally. For example, a statement such as disabled people are less likely to live independent lives might suggest a negative stereotype in a culture where independence is highly valued. However, in a place where it's the norm for everyone to live in interdependent communities, it could suggest a more neutral or even a positive attitude. We need a framework that can be applied in different cultural settings in order to evaluate the extent to which disabled people are perceived to match the norms and values in their society. The field of cognitive anthropology provides a method of measuring a so-called cultural model. For example, of what it means to be a valued member of society. Research has shown that negative health outcomes increase when an individual experiences a mismatch between their own life and the type of lifestyle that the model prescribes. However, I want to flip that and suggest that it's not so much the individual perception of not fitting in that creates a problem, but it's rather the evaluation of others that leads to social exclusion. In fact, many disabled people will tell you that we don't care that we're different. It's society and the fact that other people don't understand or consider our differences that creates a problem. So rather than asking individual respondents to indicate the extent to which they believe they're living up to social expectations, I will be investigating the perceptions of non-disabled people in terms of whether they think a disabled person could match the norms and values in their society. Now on the one hand, of course, it shouldn't matter what other people think of us. But on the other hand, it does matter because it has implications for successful implementation of social policy and the accessibility of the environment. Who is included and who gets excluded? This all depends on general social attitudes towards different abilities. Understanding the ways in which disabled people are perceived to be deviant in a particular society will allow us to develop more culturally targeted policies in order to enhance their social integration. Thank you. I think it went OK. I had one word left to say, but it almost sounded like I was finished, I think, so it was okay, but my heart's still beating fast. So a judge is looking for, you know, how well is this student presenting? Can they understand what that student is saying? You know, do they comprehend the importance of the research? Uh, do they see the applications of this? Uh, what is the significance of this research? And when I'm describing it to my students, I usually distill it down to why should I care? 
Technically, the judges are looking for two main threads. What is the efficacy of communication and what is the, the thesis? How well is the thesis of the research being presented? But what we're really asking the judges to do is to gauge how they are impacted by the work that is presented because they are representative of our community at large. Bottom line is we're talking about research by our graduate students at the University of Alabama. And there's a lot of really great stuff going on in a lot of different fields. You know, we don't always understand what research means, but there, there's research being done in creative writing, there's research being done in chemistry. So it cuts across all these fields. And I would want, you know, the audience to be able to see that there is really interesting, creative things going on in a number of different fields at the university. And, you know, we're very proud of what our students are able to do. This competition really puts the spotlight on the graduate students, their research, and, and the impact they're making. The 3MT competition gives us an opportunity as a university to represent our strengths in addressing global challenges. We also have a very strong mission to address the challenges that face our state and local communities. And 3MT brings together that array of challenges and an energetic, innovative approach to solving them. Our next competitor is Andre Bombin from the Department of Biological Sciences. His presentation is entitled, Healing Microbes. Yeah, I'm pretty much nervous and I honestly think that my anxiety can, is like the only way I can mess up everything. So <laughs> it does not make any sense to fail right now. Nowadays, the number of obese individuals is growing quickly. In the last 10 years, it increased from 400 to 700 million people worldwide. You may ask, what's wrong with being fat and happy? Obesity increases the probability of developing type 2 diabetes, cancer, and many more diseases. However, whose fault is obesity? Most of you have a friend who claims that she eats literally nothing, but still gains weight. And another one who eats sweets all the time, but is still slim. Obesity is not only correlated with the type of food we eat, but also with genotype and gut microbiota. We have around two kilograms of microbes in our guts, which combined have over 150 fold more genes than the human genome itself. The gut microbiota composition is correlated with weight gain, which partially can be explained by the increased energy extracting capabilities of obese people's gut microbiota. However, human studies are pretty limited and are mostly reduced to observations. We need a system which will allow us to manipulate gut microbiota. For us, this system is a fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster. Jacques Manot once said, anything found to be true of E. coli must also be true of elephants. So why wouldn't it work exactly the same way for flies and humans, especially according to the fact that 60% of all genes are conserved between these two organisms? In our research, we raised Drosophila on three high-fat and three normal dietary combinations of naturally rotten peaches and standard lab food to investigate how gut microbiota diversity and relative abundance of particular microbial species can influence such traits as weight gain, triglyceride storage, and glucose levels. These same traits are correlated with obesity in humans. Our study aims to identify a network of interaction between the gut microbiota, the diet, and host genotype, and evaluate their combined role in the development of obesity and its health-related consequences. Recent studies connected gut microbiota composition with almost all types of diseases, from cancer to Alzheimer's disease. It might be possible that healthy gut microbiota can grant health to everyone, from flies to humans. Thank you. I think it was fine. I, because of anxiety, I a bit speeded up, but I guess it's more or less fun. I mean, it went well. So, at least I didn't forget anything, and that's already important for me. So. Our next competitor is Kalia Torres from the Department of Psychology, and her presentation is entitled 
train your brain to close the pain gate, a treatment without side effects for pain management. My name is Galia Torres. I was born and raised in Peru, so when I moved to America in 2001, I right away noticed that, you know, it's very difficult for people that don't speak the language or they're not familiar with some of the cultural difference to navigate um, the healthcare system. Um, so I've always been interested in, in medicine and health in general. I interviewed Spanish-speaking patients in Alabama, and I was able to learn about their pain management needs and you know what, what do they want from their doctors at the time of their visit. Um, obviously one of the biggest thing it was the language barrier. So because I'm from another country and I had to learn English and I had to learn how to navigate a different country, um, specifically the healthcare system, um, it's really important for me for me to understand, you know, not only what's different, but how can other people to um, be able to successfully navigate um, a different healthcare system. One of my goals is to conduct more research in Spanish, um, to publish in Spanish, to do some um, training in Spanish for providers and as well as patients. So uh, knowing what I know and the experience that I've gotten and being from a minority background myself has given me that extra uh, passion to pursue um, this line of research and continue focusing in disparities and figuring out you know, how can we um, minimize that gap. So I am I'm very family oriented. Um, so one of the things that I always struggle with is you know explaining to my parents how valuable I am to them, right? Because uh, they're so used to like calling me and me being accessible. But being in grad school, you know, seeing patients like my schedule, it's always like booked and like it, it's funny to have to come to compromise and having that family support. Um, is really important. I think um, they take a lot of pride in the work that I do because um, they know that you know I'm especially passionate about not only grad school becoming um, PhD, but also like helping um, the Latino community. Imagine getting injured in the job and not being able to work anymore. You now don't have an income. You can't do the things you were able to do before, such as going up a flight of stairs, carry your groceries, or even cook your favorite meal because you can't stand at the stove for too long before feeling pain. You have tried everything you knew existed for pain, surgery, physical therapy, and years of pain medicine. It has now been a decade since you got injured and you're still in pain. This is a common story for many of the 25 millions of Americans that suffer from chronic pain and are constantly trying to find the best regimen for their pain management. Having pain all the time can be very stressful. It can even affect your emotional functioning and sometimes cause depression. The burden of chronic pain is even worse for individuals of low socioeconomic status who often have lower education levels and face a number of challenges towards optimal health care. In our lab, we're committed to reducing access barriers. We want everyone, regardless of literacy levels or socioeconomic status, to benefit from treatments that have been shown to work, such as cognitive behavioral therapy, also known as CBT. A treatment designed to help patients change the pattern of their thoughts and feelings because it is affecting their ability to cope with their pain effectively. We have made a number of adaptations to make these treatments easier to understand by our population. We have included pictures, we provide audio CDs with summaries of the lesson for our patients on each week, and for now, for the first time ever, patients are receiving treatment that is written at a fifth grade level instead of the typical 10th grade level. For the past three years, patients in Tuscaloosa and rural Alabama have been attending a 10-week program for pain management. They have learned a number of coping strategies, but to also understand the role of the brain in the pain experience. We tell our patients that the brain receives signals coming from the body, but it also sends signals down this gate in the spinal cord. Now we're not saying that the pain is all in your head, but instead, how can one train the brain to narrow the pain gate based on what you're thinking and feeling in that moment? The power of bringing people together to this group has allowed our patients to share their stories, but to also learn that they're not the only ones living with this silent chronic condition. Many of our patients are doing better today. Some of them are even taking less pain medication because they've learned other ways to cope with their pain. 
And for, by simplifying these treatments, we can make these treatments accessible to patients that face literacy barriers. So why should patients only rely on pain medicine that can be addicting, or surgery that can cost a lot of money, when they can also improve their psychological functioning by learning ways to narrow the pain gate? Thank you. Um, I think my pace was fine. Um, I mean, when they, you know, when they give you that 30 second count, you start wondering like, okay, I need to really make sure I cover everything I wanted to cover, but I think it went well. Our next competitor is Christopher McCoy from the School of Accountancy. His presentation is entitled, Do Strategic Earnings Disclosures Mislead Investors? I think what this competition means to me is um, it's a legacy. Our, our, our school has had a, a person in the finals, our accounting department has had a person in the final the last three years. So it was really important to me to like preserve that legacy. So I'm proud to be able to kind of continue that tradition. Every dollar you have is at risk. Whether you're a large Wall Street investor or you're shoving all your money under your mattress, your wealth and potentially even your job is dependent on the health of financial markets. Financial markets, such as the stock market, are healthy when the information in them can be trusted, when it's not misleading. We all saw this firsthand during the Great Recession when misleading information helped fuel that cycle of speculation and risk taking that led to so many losses for investors and so much unemployment. In my research, I look at a modern practice that might be misleading investors. It's my hope that my research can be used by investors in decision makings to help keep all of our dollars less at risk. At the end of every year, companies release their financial information to the public. This information represents an important news disclosure for companies. If the financial performance information, such as their profits or their sales figures, fails to exceed the expectations of markets, like in the first column, then their stock price for the company tends to decrease. However, if the company's performance can exceed the expectations of markets, then their price tends to increase, like in the second column. When companies present their information, they have options on how they can present it. They can follow the basic best practices of accounting called the Generally Accepted Accounting Principles, or GAAP. But companies can also release firm-specific, customized information that doesn't follow those basic accounting rules. We call that information non-GAAP information. The purpose of that non-GAAP information is to allow firms to present more company-specific and transparent disclosures that are relevant to investors. However, what I've found in my research is that typically companies use that information to inflate their financial performance, to make their performance look better. So I wanted to examine specifically what happens in column C, where the company is using that non-GAAP information specifically to, exclude, to exceed their financial targets. So using historically available data and a mathematical model, I look at the association between the strategic use of non-GAAP information and a firm's stock price. And what I found in my research is that that firm typically gets a positive market reaction. Their stock price typically increases. However, since I'm using historical data, I can track over time what happens to those companies. And what I find is in the years after this strategic use of non-GAAP information, firms tend to do very poorly financially. So that's why this practice is misleading. Companies are able to show short-term results that are positive that kind of hide the long-term trends down profitability. So it's my hope that investors and regulators can use my research to better understand this misleading practice in order to help keep all of our dollars less at risk. Thank you. I don't think I would have done anything differently. Um, I, I probably wouldn't have spent so much time today like kind of worrying about it. Um, I think I would have probably, um, you know, eaten a, eaten a full lunch and like, you know, not been like so nervous today. But um, I think I prepared as much as I wanted to and everything. Our seventh competitor this evening is Ashton Greer from the Department of Civil Construction and Environmental Engineering. The title of Ashton's talk is Combating Climate Change with Computer-Based Design. Um, this competition, uh, for me, it's just been uh, kind of a way to come out of my, my shell and my, my comfort bubble and uh, present my research to people who have never been exposed to it before. The American Society of Civil Engineers issues a report card every four years, assigning a letter grade to each of our major categories of infrastructure. In 2013, our overall GPA was a D+. Our infrastructure hasn't always been on the verge of failure, though. 
The engineers who designed it designed it to meet the standards and conditions of the times during which it was constructed. And for decades, it mostly performed as it should. However, changes in climate and increasing urbanization are causing floods that far exceed the capacity of the flood protection infrastructure designed for historical conditions. The objective of my research is to use geographic information systems, or GIS, to both analyze and design our current and our future water resources infrastructure. A GIS is a software program used to store, view, and analyze spatial data. In the past, it's mainly been used by geographers and engineers who wish to create digitized maps. My research pushes the limits beyond GIS's mapping capabilities by producing a novel method of designing hydraulic infrastructure completely within GIS at a simple click of the button. The first step in designing any piece of hydraulic infrastructure is analyzing land use, elevation, and precipitation data to tell me how much water is going to be flowing into it. After I've determined this peak flow, I can use a rigid set of systematic equations to determine all of the parameters needed to produce a complete design. The programming capabilities within GIS allow me to produce these designs in seconds rather than the hours that it could take to do by hand. This will allow me to perform an analysis on a large data set of existing infrastructure that, prior to the development of my GIS-based tool, would have taken far too long to be feasible. Since climate and land use have changed in the decades since this infrastructure was built, it is my hypothesis that the potentially damage-inducing effects of these results will be evident in my, res in my results. The engineers of decades past were designing for the conditions of their times, but we have the ability to move forward. The American Society of Civil Engineers won't release another report card until next year, but it's my hope that we can use these computer-based concepts to help our infrastructure pass whatever test it may face next. Thank you. Um, I think they reacted okay. I was trying to make eye contact with them throughout the whole thing, and they seemed engaged and interested in what I was saying, so hopefully they liked it. Our next competitor is Quentin Maynard from the School of Social Work. His presentation is entitled, What Happens When the Request for a Hastened Death is Denied? It's nerve-wracking, for sure. I, but I'm really excited to actually talk to people, because everyone I talk to about my research looks at me like I'm losing my mind because I want to talk about death. So it's really nice to have people who want to listen. It's just a matter of time, but 100% of the people in this room will die. Will your death be a good death? The Institute of Medicine defines a good death as one that is free from avoidable distress and suffering, reflects patient and family wishes, and is reasonably consistent with cultural, clinical, and ethical standards. If you've ever thought about how you would like to die, we might call that your good death. Some of you may wish to live as long as possible, receive life-sustaining treatments to the very end. Others may wish to forego all life-sustaining treatments and let death take its natural course. Others still may wish to hasten or speed up the impending death. When we talk about hastening death, two terms typically come to mind. First is assisted death. This is when a healthcare provider provides the means but does not participate in the act. This is legal now in seven states throughout the country. The other term, euthanasia, is when the healthcare provider not only provides the means but also participates in the act. This is illegal throughout our country. Even though these practices are illegal, we know that people still request a hasten death. What we don't know is what happens after that request is denied. My research hopes to answer that question. I'm gonna do that by conducting a mixed method study where I first survey older adults in central Alabama to get a better understanding of their knowledge and perceptions of hastening death. Then I'll follow up with people who have actually requested hastening death to get a better understanding of their experiences after that request was denied. I'll then integrate these findings so we have a clear picture of what this looks like. With the knowledge gained from my study, 
I hope to affect change at the policy level. We know that some people request the hasten death because they truly want it. And we know that others request it because they want to gauge their healthcare team's willingness to talk about these difficult topics. So if I find in my study that people who request the hasten death then engage in other life-limiting behaviors like voluntarily stopping eating and drinking without the support of their care team, we may want to advocate for policies that will allow these people to die their own good death. I hope my research allows each one of you in this room to die your own good death. Thank you. I think it went well, better than I expected at least. I didn't stumble as much as I thought I was going to. I think they, they liked it. I, I mean, my first line, they started laughing, so I was happy with that. Our next competitor is Jordan Sissel from the Department of Geography. Jordan's presentation is entitled, Cuba's Mangroves, Mapping the Past to Protect the Future. I think what this really means to me, not only as a chance to get to be a part of this with other people, present and represent the department, it's really, I've been thinking about it earlier, it's a great opportunity for me to think about my thesis and really kind of remind myself why it matters even and kind of organize my thoughts in terms of, you know, this is what's happening, this is why we're doing it, and, and just sharing it with an audience. You get so boiled down in the nitty gritty, the day to day, it's easy to kind of lose sight of the big picture. So this has helped pull me back and let me realize what I'm doing and, and why I'm doing it. Good evening. The mangroves of Zapata Swamp in Cuba are the foundation of a world that is truly unlike any other. Barnacles cling to their roots and baby fish like tarpon and grouper come of age in the still waters that those roots maintain. Bird species like spoonbill and ibis roost among their limbs and crocodiles lounge underneath the shade of their leaves. Mangroves even support tiny uh, phytoplankton communities that are in turn in evolved in thousands of other ecological interactions. Worldwide, dozens of critically endangered species rely on the ecological infrastructure that mangrove forests provide. But these critical coastal ecosystems are disappearing at a disturbing rate. In the past 20 years alone, more than one third of the world's total mangrove area has been destroyed, largely by human development and pollution. But there are some areas that remain relatively untouched, and one of these is Zapata Swamp. Now, Zapata's mangroves support hundreds of animal species, but they're also of the utmost importance to the Cuban people. Zapata's mangroves form a defensive wall, protecting nearby villages and towns from the destructive impacts of hurricanes and storm surge. Cuban fishing guides earn their living from the bonefish and tarpon populations that Cuba's mangroves support. Each year, even Cuban honeymakers move over 40,000 hives of bees into the mangroves for pollination. All said, all these things considered, mangroves provide over $27,000 per acre to the Cuban people. Now, Zapata is a national park, so its pro protected status has insulated it from some of the damaging effects that have plagued other Cuban, other mangrove uh, systems in Latin America. But nevertheless, Cuba is at a time of great social and political change it, dynamics with the United States. And this change could have drastic uh, increases on tourism and development in Cuba. And with this tourism and development could come damages to Cuba's mangrove systems. My thesis project uses satellite imagery to map and quantify 20 years of previously undocumented change in Zapata Swamp. Now, as we'd expect, we found that there was very little change. But in documenting these 20 undocumented years, not only are we bringing ourselves up to speed on what we have right now, but we're providing critical information for researchers 10 or 20 years in the future. So by mapping the past and present of Zapata's mangroves, not only are we bringing ourselves up to speed on what we have now, but we're actually protecting the future of its mangroves as, along with all the people, birds, crocodiles, and fish that those mangroves support. Thank you. Pretty well, I, I think I, I got nervous and stumbled over some words and that kind of thing, but I, I, I feel good. I'm coming down off the, the nervous rush, so it feels good to have done it and, and have it over with. We will now hear from Emily Brown from the Department of Biological Sciences. 
Her presentation is entitled, Wildlife Management Involves Trade-Offs. Now that I'm at the finals, I'm, I'm feeling pretty nervous right before I'm presenting. Um, honestly, I, I feel like I, I could puke right now, but you know what? It's okay, it's just three minutes of my life. I gotta put that into perspective, so I'm gonna be okay. A professor once told me that wildlife management is 20% about managing wildlife, but 80% about managing people. You can't have a successful wildlife management plan if the people who are being impacted by your decisions aren't on board with them. So how do we bridge the gap between government agencies and various members of the public and nonprofits? Well, for my thesis research, I'm going to be creating the management framework for the red cockaded woodpecker, an endangered species, in a section of the Okmulgee Ranger District of the Talladega National Forest, which is only 45 minutes from here. And the way I'm going to be bridging the gap between the Forest Service, nonprofits, and members of the public is through using a tool called structured decision making. And what structured decision making requires me to do is to take all these people from different backgrounds who are impacted by or care about red cockaded woodpecker management or management of their habitat, longleaf pine, and have them set goals for what they want to get out of the management. And these goals don't necessarily have to be just based on improving the red cockaded woodpecker population, but they can also focus on the other values that these stakeholders have for this area. Things that may actually even come into conflict with improving the population. Because as with any decision in wildlife, you're going to have trade-offs. You're going to have to have some compromises. These, these goals could be things like, OK, I want a certain level of timber harvest. I want to increase access for hunting. Or I want more trail access for ATVing or hiking. Things like that. So once they've gotten their goals set, they can weight these goals based on what's most important. And then we can plug them into a decision network. And the way the decision network functions is it has different decision options associated with each of these goals. And there's a likelihood associated with each of these decision options for them meeting these goals to various degrees. And we get these options, well, these different likelihoods from either data collection, scientific literature, or from our experts that we are talking to. Now, once we have all this information, we can talk again to the stakeholders and have them decide what decisions we should make based on their values and on the red cockaded woodpecker population. And what's really amazing about this network is it can be updated over time based on the actual results that we get, and we can change these likelihoods. And then we can even expand it to other parts of the Okmulgee Ranger District and even the rest of the Talladega to manage for this bird and still consider what people value. This is the future of wildlife management. You're gonna have a better rapport between the public and the government, and you're gonna have creative decision options because you have more voices being heard. Thank you for listening. Ever since I was a little kid, I knew I wanted to work with animals. I'd watch Discovery Channel all the time, I'd catch critters all the time, and I just knew that I wanted to preserve plants and animals um, for future generations because I wanted them to experience the kind of things I did as a child. So what I'm doing is I'm looking to create a management framework for red cockaded woodpeckers in a section of the Okmulgee Ranger District within the Talladega National Forest. And what I'm doing is I'm taking stakeholder feedback, so feedback from the public, or the Forest Service who I'm working with and just like putting it together to create some objectives for the management area. I reach out to experts in the field for each part of the network and have them provide me with a general probability of what they think would happen because it's really hard in scientific literature to come across probabilities. I'm still using that as a way to define these probabilities as well. Like I'm looking through papers, but a lot of the time it's really difficult to do that. So we use a combination of scientific literature and reaching out to people who have done tons of research in these different areas. What's so important about this is in areas that are frequently burned, like longleaf pine habitat, which thrives from frequent fires, there aren't a lot of dead trees, which most woodpeckers excavate in. And so pretty much every species that nests and cavities relies on red cockaded woodpeckers to create the cavities for them, including other woodpecker species. So they're just very important. I actually put together a grant for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which takes um, 
these nest box kits with cameras inside of them and puts one each in like three different elementary schools so that people can watch these bird, birds grow up. And I was like, wow, these birds are so unique and I want to help manage them. I think it'd be good to involve the public more in the management of areas they care about for wildlife so they know why we're making these management decisions and how it's going to affect them and why it's important. And we're going to take their feedback and use it to inform a management network. Our next competitor is Stephen Yates from the Department of Educational Leadership, Policy and Technology Studies. His presentation is entitled Adjuncts, the Online Teaching Majority. I'm Stephen Yates. I'm from the Educational, Educational Leadership, Policy and Technology Studies Department. Specifically, I'm in the Instructional Leadership with an emphasis in Instructional Technology Program. So, and briefly, my research, I'm looking at how adjunct faculty members on college campuses are prepared to teach online classes. I enjoy the work because I feel like I learn from my students. And plus, it's just fun to say that I teach a class at a university. These words, shared with me during a pilot study, perfectly capture why I'm standing in front of you tonight. In the summer of 2008, a mentor of mine offered me the chance to teach a class at a university. The catch was that the class was in weekend format at a satellite campus. Oh, and the full-time faculty had recently voted to discontinue offering that class in that format altogether. Regardless of these circumstances, I had a class of 28 learners ranging in age from 22 to 62, and I was hooked. Being an adjunct paved the way to my current position as a non-tenure track faculty member and teaching in an online program that boasts an 85% graduation rate, far above the national average. These experiences inspire my current research. Adjuncts, so what? Adjuncts, or part-time faculty members who are not graduate students, are the new teaching majority. The Integrated Post-Secondary Education Data System, or IPEDS, reports the percentage of adjuncts has ballooned from 35.7% of the overall higher education faculty workforce in 2005 to a whopping 70.9% in 2013. That's a 98.6% increase in only eight years. Adjuncts are attractive for budgetary and contract reasons. Colleges and universities meet their needs of keeping class offerings low, or class sizes low, class offerings high, all while maintaining an arguably anemic bl blip on that budgetary radar. Chances are a number of us in this room have been or currently are adjuncts, and more of us might be in the near future. As online education grows, so does the need for credentialed instructors. The fall of 2015 saw 2.85 million students completing all of their degree requirements online. That's roughly equal to the population of Chicago, go Cubs, or the entire state of Nevada. Studies, studies show that the, a large amount of this online teaching load is falling to the shoulders of adjuncts and they're deploying classes that they did not develop and they are not able to even update. We need data to inspire our administrators to dig in and figure out what we can do about adjunct employment and training practices. So, are adjuncts the new online teaching majority? The numbers say yes, and my research is making sure that we are able to best prepare this critical component of the higher education ecosystem. Thank you. Well, it's over. <laughs> I think it went all right. I, I, it, you know, the nerves come and go, and then I realized at one point, oh, I said something completely backwards, so I had to correct that a little bit. But I felt like it, overall, I, I felt like I, people were interested in my research, so that's really all I can hope for at this point. So, so the change that we see in students over the uh, period of the three-minute thesis uh, timeline is, is truly amazing. And you know, I always remember one of the students, I think he was in the first competition we ever ran for this, where we were asking students just to stand up and tell us about your research. And this one student stood up and he told us about his research. Or at least, I think that's what he was talking about because we honestly, none of us had any idea what he was talking about. Now, he obviously knew his stuff, very bright guy, but the way he sold it just didn't work. And so, 
this particular student, we actually worked through with him through our professional development series, and he actually won the People's Choice Award. His talk was spectacular. And I remember his department chair saying to me, wow, I mean, we knew he was a good student, but I guess we hadn't really paid him enough attention. We've got to pay him more attention. This is a sharp guy. What this really means to me, not only as a chance to get to be a part of this with other people, present and represent the department, it's really, I've been thinking about it earlier, it's a great opportunity for me to think about my thesis and really kind of remind myself why it matters. It helped me a lot, like how to summarize the entire thesis into like just three minutes. So it really helped me with the structure organization of my research. So yeah, it helps a lot. Three minute, three minute thesis helps a lot. In the long run, it gives me the opportunity to practice public speaking and realize that it's not as nerve wracking as I think it's going to be. So. If you had to explain your research to somebody that does not know what you do and may not care. How can you do that in a way that you're, they're going to end up caring and wanting to know more at the end? It means a lot. It means getting my research out so the public understands it and getting a speech prepared or just like thought about so I can talk to people about my research. It's really important to me actually because the people that are judging me are deans of this college. They're people in high positions and those are the people that I need to be working with in order to start actually making changes. We will now hear from Stephen V. Ulrich from the Department of Physics and Astronomy. His presentation is entitled, Transforming Our Energy Future Through the Understanding of Polarized Light. Feeling relieved, I guess, because, you know, this, is, uh, this has been a journey, I guess, for everyone. And, you know, after this, we can kind of go home and take a sigh of relief and not worrying about looking like an idiot in front of a bunch of people. Global temperatures are rising. That's what top scientists throughout the country, throughout the world, and at NASA tell us and have been telling us over the past several years. Uh, if the global temperatures continue to rise at the rate at which they have been, we're going to be all invited to the largest pool party we've ever seen. That's something I don't want tickets to. And that got me thinking, how can we change our energy future? And then a light went off in my head. It's the lights, the LEDs, the solar cells, the semiconducting materials that can help transform our energy future. But you're saying, Steve, we already use LEDs. We already have solar cells. I can go to the store and buy one right now. And yes, we do understand them fairly well to this point. But on a sub-microscopic level, how do these devices interact with light? Well, light, physicists like to think of, uh, travels as an ellipse or a circle. And depending on how tight this circle is or how much it leans one way or another, we get what's called a polarization. This polarization can and does interact with these devices on that submicroscopic level. But this is all theory. We've never actually been able to measure this in practice until now. I've helped develop in my research a technique where we can measure this polarization dependence and how it interacts with matter. And right now, I want to go through some of our preliminary results. If you look at the curve at the bottom of our screen here, we see a black line. This line depicts normal data that we can get of a light-emitting diode. And we see that it has a peak at one specific point. That's the color of it. And this is data that we can get right now. But what about the directional dependence I spoke of? Well, applying the technique that I've developed, we get a much broader curve, this red line. That means that we're actually getting directional dependence over a larger range of wavelengths. This is information that was hiding before us in plain view, but we could never access it before. If we implement this measurement technique and apply it to devices that we can develop every day, we might be able to make more efficient, better, more accessible devices for the world at large, and dare I say, change the world. Thank you. I think it went all right. I think it went a little faster than I should have, but eh, you know, it's done, it's over with, time to take a breath and have some fun. We will now hear from Christopher Roberts from the Department of History. His presentation is entitled, Heaven Was a Place on Earth, Historical Preservation and Religious Ideology in the New South, 1939 to 1994. 
Yeah, it's been really tough. The, the whole process has been tough, and trying to take a lot of information and, and whittle it down to three minutes has been hard. But it's uh, it's been a helpful practice, and I think it's particularly helpful when you're trying to exchange ideas across fields. And that's one of the things that I've been able to do uh, through all the preparation with the three minute thesis is um, you know just give a very concise um, analysis of what I'm doing and, and take that in from other people. So I think that's where it's most helpful. The French sociologist Emile Durkheim defined religion as a system of beliefs and practices that united a people group into a single unified community. As a religious historian, I want to add to Durkheim's understanding by analyzing the development and evolution of religious beliefs and practices over time. More specifically, I want to see how the past informs the present through the practice of historical preservation that is then incorporated into new beliefs and practices. My research centers on the Salem Camp Meeting in Covington, Georgia. Camp meetings were historically outdoor religious services that sprung up in the early 1800s across the rural South. Many of these camp meetings are sadly no longer with us, but a few of them have survived, including the Salem Camp Meeting. These camp meetings exist on the rural sites that they were originally established upon and create a sort of historical preservation mentality. I want to share with you a couple of examples of how religious beliefs and practices have developed over time at my case study, the Salem Camp Meeting. You'll notice the large uh, image on the slide is known as Kitty's Cottage. This cottage was the home of a former slave built by her master in the early 1800s, or the 1840s. It was moved to Salem in 1939, however, and there it was transformed into a museum dedicated to Southern religion and the Confederacy. Inside the museum, the Salem community could go to reflect upon images of Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, and other relics of the Old South that were intended to evoke a sense of longing for a Southern past that had gone by. The symbol of the cottage informed new beliefs and practices within the community. But historical preservation is not always material. In 1975, Tom and Agnes Elliott introduced the song Sweet, Sweet Spirit to the Salem Camp Meeting. Tom loved the song so much that his final words to the Salem Board of Trustees before his death were, keep the sweet, sweet spirit going. To this day, Salem Camp Meeting begins and ends every camp meeting with the singing of Sweet, Sweet Spirit in remembrance of Tom Elliott. These symbols and rituals are historical preservations that have led to new uh, practices and beliefs within the community. What my research suggests is that while sociologists like Durkheim do a fantastic job of analyzing the role of beliefs and practices within society, it is only through the long scope of history that we are able to analyze how these beliefs and practices are formed, develop, and evolve over time. It is therefore that history is a vital ingredient to anything that we would choose to define as religion. Thank you, and roll tide. I had to freestyle a little bit there. I, I kind of got off track, um, which I guess happens, but that was you know, part of the process, I guess, and, and I recovered, I think, so hopefully nobody noticed. So. Our next competitor is Tarita Poole from the Department of Educational Studies in Psychology, Research Methodology, and Counseling. The title of her talk is Problem Solving, Learning, and the Confusion Conundrum. My name is Tarita Poole. Um, I am a learning scientist. I study um, how emotions affect cognitive processes. My research specifically is looking at confusion in the context of learning environments, school environments. But what happens is because we hear this language as part of our everyday lives, just on TV, on the radio, there was confusion about this and they were confused. We carry that over. And so when you get to school, confusion is the same confusion that's out there, the confusion that's bad. And I really feel like the research I'm doing underpins or supports the research that we do in, in all other areas. So we're training future scientists, doctors, teachers, lawyers, all kinds of jobs. The world is full of complex issues and we're not going to be able to run away from things so we need to become comfortable with the fact that we're, we're not going to know and how do you navigate that feeling of not knowing or that feeling of confusion. 
Both of my kids have ADD. You know, when they were in school, I would help them and there would be times when they would be frustrated and they wouldn't understand something. And I, I guess I did really start with them. Um, and so I started using language with them that normalized what it means to not know, that it's, it's okay if you don't. That's part of the process of learning. I had so many people come up to me and say, you know, I'm one of those people that has felt like confusion is something bad, or I'm a student who has a learning disability and now I don't feel stupid. That keeps me going and keeps me really interested in my research and fired up to get it done. This is my second time doing three minute thesis. I finished in third place last year, which I was really excited about and I loved it. It was a lot of fun um, and it, I just said, I want to do it again. I want to see if I can win. My research means the world to me. You know, I really am passionate because I want people to enjoy learning. I'm really invested in this. You know, as I walk down to the stage when I'm, when I'm standing there, you know, this is my research, this is my, my work, and nobody knows it like I do. And so even if, even if I don't do it perfectly, it's still my work and I wanna, I wanna be able to present it proudly. Picture a group of students gathered around a smart board. They've been given a task that is unfamiliar and complex. Of course, none of them has any expert knowledge to rely on, so they reach a mental fork in the road where the feeling of confusion looms large. But what happens next? How do they interpret this uncomfortable feeling? And what does it mean for their learning? These questions are the focus of my research. So we invest a great deal of time and money in studying how people learn. Because learning is not just about memorizing and recalling facts. Instead, it's really about developing the capacity to think deeply and solve complex problems like how to create renewable energy, combat climate change, and conquer life-limiting conditions. And now, we've embarked on a whole new frontier where learning scientists like me believe that beyond general intelligence and textbook knowledge, emotions like confusion could also play a critical role in problem solving. But we're still sorting this out. While previous studies do show confusion can play a positive role in problem solving, I've observed that some students perceive or interpret confusion as a sense of threat, and they often stop trying. Yet other students perceive it more as a sense of challenge and are ready to forge ahead. So how do we make sense of these questions? Well, an answer proposed in my dissertation is that students perceive confusion in different ways as a consequence of their learning beliefs and goals. And these differences can affect the cognitive or thinking strategies they might use when trying to solve a fuzzy problem. The theory goes that meaningful learning is a constructive process which takes time. And we learn more when our goals are aimed at mastery instead of trying to look smart. So when students feel confused, they might not like it. But if they focus on mastery and believe that new understanding is built over time, this feeling can act as a powerful emotion signal that prompts them to switch from using simple strategies like memorization to more complex ones like analyzing. And this could ultimately improve their problem solving and learning. Now, I've tested this idea in a pilot study where a sample of students answered survey questions about their learning beliefs, goals, and emotion perception. Then I measured their confusion while they studied a set of scientific arguments and tried to identify accurate solutions. The results of my analysis showed that students who are concerned about proving their intelligence and believe that learning is simple and quick were more likely to perceive confusion as threatening. And that had a negative effect on the accuracy of the solutions they could identify. Now these findings are preliminary but promising and if confirmed in my full study, I hope to develop academic interventions like emotion reframing that can transform the meaning of confusion and make it a normal part of learning. After all, the students working in our classrooms today, encountering all those new complexities, well, they are the problem solvers of tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>
traffic jam, and mobility. Let's look at the picture to the right of the screen. Now think about the time that you occasionally waste stuck in jam due to an accident that you are not directly involved in. It's very frustrating to be parked on the road and you have no information how long you're going to be parked there. We do know that crashes cause congestion, which are dynamic in nature, can be low, can be medium, or can be high severe congestion. But let me ask you a question. What level of congestion or delay can you expect from any given crash event? That's where my research comes in. My objective is to try and develop a model that can be used to predict crash congestion and crash delays. Now to do this, I analyzed 4,814 crash events that occurred on Interstate 65 in Alabama in 2014 from Mobile to Huntsville, a stretch of 366 miles. I also used historical speed data, which are records of the real-time vehicle speeds at the time of the crash, just before the crash occurred, and after the crash occurred. Now, I analyzed all this data and developed charts called time-space diagrams. Simply, these are charts similar to the one shown on the screen, which shows you the exact location of the crash, the time the crash occurred, the time the queue started building, the time the queue cleared, the recovery shock waves, and the time that the traffic finally resumed normal operations. Now, using the time-space diagrams, I then estimated what is called the speed difference per mile per hour. This was based on what is the fall in free flow speed that that crash caused? What stretch of road did that speed fall cover? And for how long did it last? Now using this speed difference per mile per hour, I then categorized the congestion and delay from every crash into groups comprising no congestion, low congestion, medium congestion, and high congestion. Now, together with this data, I added other relevant parameters that affect congestion, such as lane width, shoulder width, and in total, I had 653 independent variables for consideration. Now, finally, I use advanced statistical and econometric techniques to develop a mixed logic model for predicting crash congestion and delays. Now, using this model, I further identified 40 significant variables and grouped them into eight categories comprising road geometry, temporal settings, weather, which is also summarized on the table on the screen. Now, the findings from this research can be used to improve crash incident management and minimize congestion attributed to a crash. It can also be used to provide accurate and reliable information to road users like you and me about expected delay from a crash. Now, next time you see a billboard written, accident ahead, expected delay, 10 minutes. Remember, my model could have been used. As we move on to the next phase of this evening, I think we should give all the competitors a round of applause for an excellent job. And we'd also like to thank our judges. So let me just tell you what's up next. Um, our judges will convene and will determine the winners for this evening. In the meantime, you have a chance now to vote for the people's choice uh, for this evening. So please mark your ballot, choose one presentation, and we ask that you um, move your ballots to the middle of the aisles and we will have a volunteer come and pick them up. We have a reception right now so if you'd like to convene out into the reception area we'll be about 15 minutes while we tabulate the results. Thank you. I'm going to give you back your judging sheet so you can look at it. You can keep it exactly how it is or you can decide, you know, I don't really think this person should be there or there. Um, it's supposed to be more of a panel. These numbers kind of give you a, a good estimate of where you are all thinking, but it doesn't have to stay this way. Well, I'm driving to Georgia to buy a lottery ticket because my top four are the top four. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, Susan, I'm driving to Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious to see who the people's choice is because mm -hmm. yeah. this may be the first time, at least in my experience, that the people's choice is the same as what they were. 
So I'm gonna be checking. You had number one higher. Not Who higher. Had 132. There was one points difference between second and third. Second had 133, and third has 132. You guys are great. That we did wonderful. But who got people's choice? Do we? Yeah. Well, let's have another round of applause for these amazing contestants. It was really so much preparation, so much passion, and um, really excellent execution uh, from all 15. And the, the judges' scores uh, had a really tight race going and people's choice as well. So it is really an honor and a pleasure to uh, announce the winners. And thanks to the generosity of the Office of Research and Economic Development, we will make sure that everyone leaves a winner. So um, I'm pleased to have here Caroline Bell and Ken Corbett, executive officers of the Graduate Student Association, who also contribute from their own funds to recognize the work of these amazing scholars. Um, I also want to mention that we had prospective graduate students here today, and what a way to show off our campus to prospective graduate students. So I hope they enjoyed that. So I will now read uh, the honorable mention winners in alphabetical order. Andre Bombin, congratulations. Come down and Emily Brown from Biological Sciences. Jordan Sissel from Geography. Ashton Greer from Civil Construction Environmental Engineering. Miriam Holloman from Anthropology. Christopher McCoy, Accountancy. Karen Nordine, Communication Studies. Christopher Roberts, History. Kalia Torres from Psychology. Stephen Ulrich from Physics and Astronomy. And Samuel Zephaniah from Civil Construction and Environmental Engineering. So there are co congratulations to all of you. And I hope all of those research discoveries come to fruition because I really want to see what comes of this. Um, but I'm very pleased now to announce the four uh, top winners. And you can see the uh, rewards that will come their way. So I will read the, the titles of their presentations. Uh, fourth place, what happens when the request for a hasten death is denied? Quentin Maynard from Social Work. Third place, adjuncts the online teaching majority, Stephen Yates from Educational Leadership. Second place, E equals F squared, let's revolutionize the way we do exercise here, Kendra Patil. And our first place winner, problem solving, learning, and the confusion conundrum, Tarita Poole from Educational Psychology. Congratulations. So, uh, Tarita will represent the University of Alabama at regional competition and we'll be proud to be there to support her. And finally, this is uh, an engaged proceeding and so we're very grateful to everyone who turned in a People's Choice ballot. Um, it was a very tight competition and I'm very pleased to uh, say that your views aligned with those of the judges and Tarita Poole, congratulations.
Thank you again to our judges. Really appreciate this evening of your time. Thanks to all of you who came out to support and congratulations to all 15 of you. Thank you. Um, amazing, incredible, awesome. I, I am surprised I won first place a little bit. We had a lot of great presentations, uh, but then also to win People's Choice. Uh, very humbling and um, maybe it kind of feels like my hard work paid off.